freaking first cut. Golly. Welcome to the First Cut Podcast. I'm Rick Gaiman, and this is your mega preview pod for this week's Valspar Championship. It's storylines, it's best bets, it's that pesky one and done. Joining me to break it all down, Greg Ducharme is here. Greg, hello, sir. What's going on, boys? Uh, excited to be here. Looking forward to Valspar week. A great golf course, great tournament. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Might be an Adam Hadwin week, Greg. It could be. We already got a comment in the chat about it. Um, this may... This may be, I don't remember exactly, but this may be when I admitted the uh, love that I have for Adam Hadwin. <laughs> I thought it was around the West Coast swing. If it wasn't Valspar, it was Valero. I don't think it was West Coast. Okay. Oh, you, well, you know what? It could have been It could have been a desert event. Um, I thought it was Palm Springs. but Yeah, uh, that, could have, that could be. Who I could might say? be. Yeah, who can, yeah true, well, exactly. truly, truly. Uh, that right there is Kyle Porter. Kyle, uh, welcome in and good to see you. You too. I'm actually not going to be around for the end of this. So uh, let's just say I am a big, I'm a bigger fan of Adam Hadwin than the biggest fan of Adam Hadwin is this week. Wow. That's a little bit of foreshadowing. That's right. We were going to do a little hot swap. Kyle's got a hard out at some point. Allegedly, Mark Immelman will be joining us. Maybe we'll see how that goes. Uh, we do indeed have the first cut bracket challenge link in the description. If you want to play against us in March Madness, get your bracket in. We'll get you like some Paramount Plus stuff if you go out and win there. You can have the glory of being on top of the first cut bracket challenge. Golly, Greg, have you filled out a bracket yet? Uh, I've started to. Preliminary draft is in the works. Uh, I'm going to get this thing <laughs> finalized in the very near future before Thursday. How much time do you have on your hands? None. A preliminary draft? Yeah, basically none. It's like, you know, when you when you fill out a, a, a... Rick will know about this. You fill out a dummy lineup in DFS just to get something on paper, and just then you go started. back and check. Yeah, when I got to collect my thoughts a little bit more. Uh, go back, run the numbers, you know, see what Rick tells me to do, and uh, and then I'll go with that. If you told me to name all the number one seeds, I, I could not. I don't, I don't think I could. I told I told Josh before, I could literally, I could not name one NCAA basketball player. Not one from any team. There's like 300 teams. I can literally <laughs> not name one of them. I don't know. I could probably get an Oklahoma State guy or two, but not, not more than, I can't name anybody on any other team besides Oklahoma State. What do you think about this uh, offer from David? He says the bracket challenge winners should get 30 seconds of open mic live on the pod to roast Kyle. <laughs> wow. That first off that, that would be expensive. So that would, you'd have to go, you'd have to win. You'd have to be pretty good. I feel like, I feel like David is clamoring for that. <laughs> he can, he can send in a video. We'll play it on. I don't care. I That's I'm I'm good with that. That's so bring good. it on. Uh, all right, we do have to get into this because we've got we got a smaller window with everybody than normal. And gentlemen, breaking news, big news in the game of golf. Uh, and I'm not even really exaggerating all that much because today the USGA and the RNA proposed a rule to dun 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 roll back the golf ball. Things that have been discussed and tested for years and years and years became closer to becoming official. I don't even know where to start here. Kyle, I guess I'll just start uh, with you. This this bifurcation, that's a word you're going to hear a ton in the next couple of years. So let's get used to that. Bifurcation, which is splitting the game from everybody using the same equipment from recreational players, amateurs to professionals uh, into two separate paths. This would allow for a local rule to be put into a play into place where golf ball restrictions would be put on elite golf competitions. Yeah. I think at some point this has to happen, right? You can't, um, you can't, I mean, you can't keep lengthening number 13 at Augusta national, you know, they already, they lengthened it for this year. You can't continue to do that for the next. This isn't about, and again, I think the argument that people make is like, hey, things are fine. And it's like, okay, sort of, but what about 100 years from now? Unless you believe that distance is going to stop increasing, 
which you can make that argument, I guess. I don't think it's a great argument. Then you have to implement some sort of s- s- like limit in place. And I thought Mike Wan, I was on the, the press conference today with Mike Wan and Martin Slumbers, and I thought he was – he, he was fascinating because he said, you know, this is not like an end-all, be-all solution. This is – we might be back in the same spot 15 years from now. And I thought that was good foresight. And, you know, I, I thought it was pretty uh, intriguing. One one thing that I was thinking about is like it. this is so – somebody brought this up. I forgot who. But the fact that you can use your own ball in in a professional sport <laughs> – it's pretty crazy. Right? I mean, you can make the Tom Brady joke, but like you can't is like what if you could use your own ball in baseball? Like what, <laughs> what if what if like Rawlings came out with a T ninety four X baseball and that's a, that's what Clayton Kershaw pitched with? <laughs> that would be that'd be a, absurd. Like that would be completely insane. And so I, I don't I don't really hate the idea of just sort of a uniform ball. Um, I don't know. There's a million directions we could go with that, but I, I, it, it, I think it's a, I think what they implemented is a good thing. Yeah. We'll start picking them off here, Greg. The intention of this is to only be adopted in elite competition. It is not intended to impact recreational golf. So the way that they're, proposing to do this the usga and the rna is to have a model local rule an mlr that is something else you will hear a lot of in the next couple of years and this local rule can be adopted by say the pga tour and if you play on the pga tour you're playing under this local rule or it could be adopted by augusta national or it could be or augusta national could say nah we we don't want anything to do with this use use the regular balls use the old balls right so this is an attempt to, uh, which I, I don't think would happen, but an attempt to only address uh, ball golf balls at the highest possible level. Yeah, and this is, um, I think, uh, g- they're going to run into a real problem with this uh, unless everybody can come together and be on board. Uh, and for that reason, just imagine this scenario. The PGA Tour do- decides not to adopt this local rule. Because ultimately, the PGA Tour likes birdies being made. Uh, they like guys hitting really long tee shots. They promote that. They don't really grow the rough up a whole lot. They they don't set in, in most of their events. They don't set the golf course up as difficult as it possibly can be set up. They want to see some scoring, uh, particularly on Sundays. So what if the PGA Tour doesn't adopt the local rule uh, and the USGA and RNA do? Are you going to ask an equipment manufacturer to manufacture, go through research and development and develop an entire line of products for the U S open? And by the way, it's a golf ball. You can't sell to the public. So you're going to ask uh, Titleist and Bridgestone and TaylorMade and Callaway to invest this large sum of money. And it's a large sum of money into a golf ball that they can't sell. Um, That's, uh, I I think, a very difficult ask. And all of a sudden, if the PGA Tour doesn't doesn't go with this, you run into a real problem because who's going to play, who's going to make the ball you've suggested gets made to conform? And I don't know who, I don't know who does it. So they really need the PGA Tour to get on board if they are going to get on board with this. And if the PGA Tour doesn't really think that it's a problem, uh, then it becomes a problem for the USGA and the RNA. Uh, it becomes a really big problem for them. So I, I, I ultimately, I look at this in a much broader scale in the game of golf than uh, the, the game of golf as an industry as a whole, rather than just the PGA Tour. Uh, and you got to look at OEMs. You have to look at players who are trying to qualify for a U.S. Open. Uh, amateur players who are attempting to go into college. And there will be a, uh, to use a Ronald Reagan term, a trickle down effect uh, on on this. And at what point do you decide as a young, re- quote unquote, recreational player, at what point do you decide that you're going to go and play the elite game? Uh, and are, are you going to have 
access to those golf balls to play those golf balls. It's, it's a very complicated thing. And, and I don't think you can simply draw a line uh, between the PGA tour, um, the, the professional golf world and everybody else. I, I don't really think that that's a, a, a feasible way of doing things. So ultimately um, I, I think there's a lot of problems in this. Uh, well, we're going to solve one of those problems right now because we're going to add another voice to the conversation. We've got Mark Immelman here, I believe. There he is. Hello, Mark. Hey, guys. How are we doing? I'm doing well. How about yourself? Fine. I was listening to uh, Greg's um, input there, and it's all pretty savvy. Yeah, this is a big deal. This, um, I was somewhat surprised when I saw the press release. I did not see. We didn't know any of this was coming last week unless I was just very in the dark and wrapped up in my job. Well, let me let me uh, throw it right to you, Mark. Get you in the hot seat early here. So obviously, USGA and RNA announcing this, and also sending these uh, documents to the equipment manufacturers. The equipment manufacturers hate this. They don't want to make another golf ball special for just a, a elite competition, as as Greg mentioned. It's not even a ball that you can sell. And I do wonder where we draw the line, right? Uh, Augusta National, yeah, obviously. The majors, of course. The PGA Tour, sure. Corn Ferry, uh, yeah, I think that makes sense. What about qualifying? What about sectionals? What about Division I college golf? What about, like, where there is going to be a line somewhere that says this is the line. I have no idea where that's at. Well, I would probably, right off the top of my head, go with what we've seen in the past. Not, I'm old enough to know back in the day when Callaway came out with a driver called the uh, ERC that they'd push the, uh, push the limits of MOI um, at, at contact and the, 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 the way the face reacted with the ball sort of basically beyond what was legal. And so there was a, a tournament version of the ERC and then there was a jacked up version or something that was really hot that you know players would use when they weren't playing an event. So I would say they would draw the line right off the bat probably um, somewhere at the bottom end of the professional game. If you're in college, the NCA would govern how they go with things. Kind of like, you know, in college, they use an aluminum bat. Yet when you get in the major leagues, you use a wooden bat. And, and that, to me, ostensibly is, is how I see the thing going around. Um, I can understand where the USGA and the RNA came from. I'm glad they finally did because for the longest time, they were trying to sell us on these studies that they did where they're like the ball's not going any farther. And they'd suck up these horrid numbers that everyone knew that were just completely out of bounds really so now they have identified the issue there is an issue if you talk to all the players they will tell you there's an issue because they're stronger they got the olympic ideal they're stronger faster higher the whole thing um and so some of the data is off kilter um and the truth of it is on the tour or whatever tours because I'm, I'm sure the tours will jump into lockstep you're going to be long whether you're using a, 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 a slowed down ball or a, long, a longer golf ball. That's just how it is. Length will still be an advantage. All that I see that's happening with this is it's making a number of the golf courses that have become obsolete real again. And the truth of it is like, oh, goodness, uh, I'm, I'm trying to think of a place. Like Torrey Pines. That place is <laughs> mammoth. And I saw guys getting to some of the targets with wedges and stuff even now. So it was getting to a place with the ball getting faster and faster and faster. And these guys, guys getting stronger and stronger and stronger. And with technology and understanding footwork and, and force uh, production and all that sort of stuff now, because golf has become like a science, that the guys are maximizing that. And so as a result, you have to hem the thing in somewhere. And so I'm glad the, the governing bodies did it because in the locker room, the players would tell you the same thing. So to what Greg was saying, I'd be surprised if the tour didn't jump on board. And the tour and the DP World Tour work together, so I'm sure the two major tours in the world will will be okay with this. Now, um, live maybe they might go with an extra hot golf ball. Who knows? Uh, but but right now, I think that the PGA Tour will be on board. Golf, golf, but hotter is what they can call it. Uh, Kyle, let's close the loop on on this for a second here, because there's there's two things I find um, really interesting. One, I'm I'm interested in how they do this, right? So, what from my understanding, the the current restrictions around the golf ball are generated on a robot that swings the club at 120 miles an hour, okay. which is absurd. Just amazing visual yeah. already. Just incredible stuff. Yes. Now, what they're going to do is they're essentially going to keep those same restrictions, all that fun stuff, but they're cranking the robot to 127 miles an hour. So the ball, in theory, 
if you swing it at 127 miles an hour, it will act as if you have swung it at 120, which it, I, I love that, but that that's, that's how they're going to do this. They're trying to target that upper end elite golfer. Yeah. If you read the press release, you're like, I don't, I might not understand English. Like I don't, <laughs> I don't understand any of what's being said here. Yeah. I think Greg's point is really interesting <clears throat> because you, and th th this was, uh, it, we never ha had to explain this very, very much before live, but now it's like paramount to understand that there are five organizations that run golf essentially. And it would be as it, the, the weird part about all this is you got the USGA and RNA are in charge. It, it would be like if the Euro league was telling the NBA, like, here are your rules. <laughs> Right. And the NBA is like, <laughs> wait a second. What? Like you're telling us what our rule, like the U and what I mean by that is the USGA and RNA, like they, they only have one massive event a year. Right. And the PGA tour is the place where the, the stars play most of their golf, like at least time wise, they play most of their golf. And it's just, it's such a weird aspect where you could argue that the USGA is a less, powerful organization than the pj tour i don't know if i would make that argument you you could make it and they're telling the pj tour like here's your rules you know and i know i know that's how things have always been it's just like it's just a strange thing and i i don't know i'm with greg i don't know like what is going how that's going to go for all these different organizations so so the other thing greg and i, I and maybe correct me if i'm wrong i think that the big thing comes back to the golf courses Right. That, that that's what this comes back to. Are we going to be able to go to Marion ever again? You know, what is going to happen when this thing just turns into driver wedge everywhere? What Bryson did to Wingfoot, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It is likely, or I guess in an ideal world, going to preserve the opportunity to continue to play these elite golf courses without having to get them all back to 8,000 yards, which is not feasible uh, and not a that ends up being a slippery slope. Yeah. Although I, I just, I think that's a misguided thought. I okay. think it's a misguided concept. You look at, first of all, in 2013, this is, there are two sides to this one in 2013, Marion was under 7,000 yards and over par was the winning score. Uh, and, and it, the last time there were th three occasions, the winning score was over par. Greg, one was Greg, at Shinnecock, which Greg, was the fairways were the size of your study. And Marion in 2013. I mean, they yeah. they got to trick places up a little bit to defend par and uh, with to, against these guys if they. Okay, should. the other one was uh, the Olympic Club, right? Which is what 7,100 yards. It's a not a very big golf course. I know it plays longer, being in California and all and and all that. Um, Shinnecock was the other one, which had insane greens at the time. Um, but you look at Aaron Hills that was that was nearly 8,000 yards and 17 under par one. So distance isn't to me, distance is not the the priority when it comes to difficulty. Uh, there are other priorities. A rough is one thing. Trees are a big thing. And as you start to take out more and more trees, which we do in this game right now, the motto is get rid of all the trees. And guess what? When you miss fairways, all of a sudden you, there's only rough in the way. And now the high club head speed has the advantage. So if, if you want to slow the game down, which is in kind of an odd idea that would never play in any other sport, there's no other sport that's looking to slow the game down. Uh, and if you slow the game, if you want to slow the game down, you can add trees. Um, and all of a sudden you have to be a little more precise and accuracy becomes something that's a little more important when you have trees, you also limit the factor of the trampled down rough, which I think Kyle mentioned the other night, right? You have the, in the game of golf, the farther, the bigger you miss, the more trampled down it is in a lot of cases, but when there's a hazard in the air and there's a tree blocking your way, all of a sudden that big miss becomes a bigger penalty. Uh, so there are so many different ways that you can design golf courses that will uh, that will limit distance. There are, are endless ways you can do that. Um, so, well, and, and one of them is stop cutting trees down. If, if I may real fast, you, that is a very savvy point. It really is. 
but with the tightness of money nowadays, people aren't really designing championship golf courses anymore. They're fixing up old places and they're fixing up old places by making conditions firmer. But you also run into an issue then with summertime rains. PGA Tour, you know, after April, it becomes a scoring bonanza because you can't get places firm because you're going to have an afternoon thunderstorm or two. You saw what it did to the players last week. That place was like an ice rink on Friday morning. Get some rain Friday evening and the next day it's a freaking birdie fiesta. Because the guys can hit it along to your point, which I agree with. I mean, I spoke with Finau the one time, and he was like, they can make these courses 8,000 yards. We're still going to shoot the grass off the place unless it's firm with rough. So I'm with you on the rough. It's always been that way, by the way. So now you're going you're gonna to go down this path because you have some golf courses that get soft and scoring gets really low, and you're going to affect the entire industry in unknown ways. Like, this is not something that has been tested. I know they've looked at data. But they've looked at data and how long the longest players in the world have gotten. And they're looking at it from a perspective of the golf course. Uh, I mean, the, the guy who started this entire process in Mike Davis is a guy that left the USGA to go into golf course architecture. He, <laughs> he is a golf course architect. He's looking at it from that perspective. But the perspective of everybody else in the game is a little bit different. It, it's different. Right. The, the other stakeholders see the value in having PGA Tour players and recreational players play in the same equipment. I mean, it, it's the, the pyramid of influence in golf is different than every other sport because the fans of the game play the game. And and so all of a sudden, when Justin Thomas is wearing a Titleist hat, it has a, a tremendous value. When you have that sponsorship on the leaderboard that you were talking about just the other day, Rick, where it tells you how many, you know, what golf ball the guys are playing, right? That sponsorship carries a value because as a consumer, you say, oh, wow, look at how many guys on this leaderboard are playing a Titleist golf ball. Maybe I should too. But when that ball gets changed and you aren't going to play the ball that they play, it loses a lot of value for the PGA Tour. Because now all of a sudden their players and their sponsorships become a, a, a little bit less valuable. Let me let me get Kyle in here real quick, Mark. We got a lot, ten more minutes with him. So so KP, couple couple of things here. Um, it, it, you are good at comparing what's going on in golf to other sports. There is no other sport that is trying to make it harder to score. Baseball has implemented a ton of rules this off season to make offense more important. They have not extended the length of a basketball court because it takes LeBron James three steps to get from end to end. Um, wouldn't wouldn't a if we care about scoring wouldn't it the cheapest option be to change a par 72 into a par 68 <laughs> <laughs> like have i just solved golf's problem and by the way well, the usga does they the usga does that yeah. they do they do they always uh, change par <clears throat> Changing par is like the solution to everything, I think, right? <laughs> right. Like literally, if, if it's a par 70 instead of a par 72 and the winning score is six under, do we hear about this instead of being 18 under or 20 under? <laughs> Say that again. If the par – Yeah, if, if they make – if they make instead of par 72s, for example, they're par 70s. And now the winning scores are single digits under par instead of deep into double digits. Like I feel like it's not the distance. It's the scoring that people see and people care about. They say courses are getting shredded, so they must be too easy. The easy point is to say distance is crazy. When really, if we just, if distance can be the same, just make them par 70s or par 68s. Yeah, I think, well, the other thing you could do, many people have said this, just get, just get rid of tees, ban tees. <laughs> That would that would be truly I'm, sick. I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure that that I'm I'm confident that's been spoken about. I, that would be nuts. That would be sweet. regulation in there. Foot, your Put football. It, they used to kick the thing off the ground. Now they got a big T like this. They can kick the thing out of the end zone nearly every single time. The kickoff. The kickoff guy. Ban tees. I'm in. Um, so the thing, Rick, about other sports is you do like golf is <clears throat> uh, defenseless. Right. In baseball, you have a pitcher in uh, football. You have a cornerback in basketball. You have a center, a power forward, all defending the the offensive player and all sort of evolving at the same rate that the offensive player is evolving at. 
in golf, the defense is the golf course, which has to like, it can't evolve. Right. I mean, you, you can plant trees. I don't know that we want to plant trees at like the old course. Right. I don't, I don't know if like, that's the greatest <laughs> evolution of St. Andrews. Um, and so there has to be some sort of third party that is like serving as the def like helping the golf course in its defense of players. If that's like a, like that a public, sense. it's like a public attorney. <laughs> Kyle. Kind of, yeah. <laughs> Kyle, that is a fantastic point. I mean, because you say that and I get to thinking, I'm like, if this wasn't really that important, the Augusta National, you wouldn't see third, you wouldn't see them buying some of Augusta Country Club's land to make number 13 longer. I mean, if you couldn't make that a par four, that would be sacrilegious. So you're right. It's defending the golf courses. That's a great point. And, and I don't know if it's a, I don't know if it's necessarily about scoring because I think that, Scoring can be hard on on short holes, right? Like uh, short par fours. Like we see them, like it's very difficult to score on some of those holes a lot of the time. I think it's more about. This is going to sound like old man of me, but like sort of the integrity of the way the the courses were meant to be played, right? I don't I don't think sixteen at Sawgrass was meant to be like driver sand wedge like Rory hit last week or somebody hit in, into that hole. And so it, it, it's, it's more like, can, can we go to St. Andrews 20 years from now and anybody hit uh, more than like eight iron, mm -hmm. Yeah, you know? And, and, and I just don't know that that's like, I, I think what the USGA and RNA are trying to do is preserve the, this is again, like, sort of out there, but preserve like the beauty of, of the way the game is played. And that sounds high minded, but I, I think there is a little bit of that going on here. I would add to that pre preserve some of the relevancy of the record books. Cause let's sure. say yeah, the, absolutely. in 20 years time and you guys have guys, they'd be driving it over number one, the way things are going now, if they could get a correct wind. So, so yeah, Kyle, your, the points you make, they're so on the mark and, the, the those two governing bodies they are the custodians of the game and the game just isn't the PGA Tour players it's the defense of the great pallets the great golf courses these guys get to show off their skills and places where and you talk to everyone they're like so what makes St Andrews or Augusta National or whatever great they're like because I'm playing from the same place that whoever did back in the day Ben Hogan and so your point there is uh, that's nailed man who will be the first guy to accidentally put the grab up a golf ball out of his bag? It'll be the wrong ball, and he flies DJ. it 25 yards further than DJ. everyone else. And we're like, What? DJ is gonna have three balls, they're gonna have to, they're gonna have he's to got a be... live ball. <laughs> we're gonna, gonna have, have to color, we're gonna have to color code these things, but but think about this for a minute, right? Think about governing this because remember when a couple of years ago they came out with the blocks or the players couldn't carry the greens maps on the PGA tour. Cause they had these massive printouts that basically told you exactly the slope of the green, wherever you want it to be. And they'd sit there and just kind of chart their golf ball and go, Oh, from yeah, it's a 2% break. Then they'd aim point the thing and they'd make putts from all over the joint. So the tour goes, no, you don't have that anymore. But I wonder who was marshalling the thing. So yeah, I'm, there's going to be someone who, who does the wrong thing. Yeah, I did you see I do wonder who's marshalling did, the thing. Yes, did you uh, see the comment that, <laughs> Somebody said, how does this affect distance per shot? <laughs> yeah, I did see that. It was really good. That We we have single-handedly already blown up SI Golf's uh, world ranking calculations. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I so, wish I would have thought of that. So so here's where we're at. Um, we got, well, I'm going to get Kyle out of here in a second. But this will now enter a feedback stage where manufacturers and golf stakeholders can provide feedback until August 24th. If adopted, this will take place January 1st, 2026, which is about, oh, I don't know, two years and nine months from now. So something we'll be talking about moving forward. KP, it's been an absolute pleasure. We will reveal your picks and your one and done on the other side, but thank you for your uh, attendance and debate today. Absolutely. Speaking of other sports, I got uh, I got to go throw some BP to my kids' baseball team. Yeah, uh, <laughs> and I'm I'm Adam Hadwin heavy on the picks. So, oh, enjoy nice. everybody. Good choices. Lovely. We will chat. Uh, Kyle Porter at Kyle Porter CBS on Twitter. We will chat about 
Valspar will reveal our picks. We'll reveal our one and done selections. But first, we will take a quick break and hear a word from our partners. Bracket season is here. Join the madness by playing the official bracket game of the NCAA. Get the CBS Sports app and be part of the madness. Be part of the madness. The the Eye on College Basketball Podcast is booming right now. Obviously, a very good time for them. You can check it out. Valspar, gentlemen. Greg, we'll start here with this golf course. The Copperhead course. The Snake Pit. What types of things can we expect as, as we're talking about courses trying to challenge the best players in the world? <laughs> Uh, well, you have a pretty cool golf course that um, I think does provide a really good challenge for players. It's a little bit different than most of the golf courses in Florida. There's not nearly as much water out there uh, coming into play. And I think it provides a really fair test. You do have some trees out there, which I love. Um, by the way, on the trees thing, the the defense on a Lynx golf course is in the air. There is one in the air that's the wind. Uh, and so sometimes... The wind blows and it gets a lot harder. Other times, like this past year at St. Andrews, there's no wind and it gets a lot easier. Um, and there's nothing you can do about that. But anyway, Valspar, Innisbrook, Copperhead course is um, is definitely a challenge. Um, you have some pretty quick and slopey greens. Uh, you have a lot of dog legs. You have some elevation change in Florida, which presents a really unique test. Um, and I think it really requires an all around game. I mean, it is. And if you look at your metrics, Rick, on, on rickrungood.com, it definitely highlights iron play. You think of the last couple of winners, Sam Burns coming in the last two years was a very high level iron player. Um, Paul Casey, the two years before that, very high level iron player. Uh, and of course, Adam Hadwin before that, uh, very high level iron player, which is why I love him so much. It's not necessarily just the beard. It's the golf swing and the, uh, the, the golf swing and the iron play specifically. But the other thing is the reason I say it's a uh, all in, you know, it, it requires an all around game is the last five winners, all those players I just mentioned, also finished inside the top 10 the week of their win in either strokes gain putting or strokes gain around the green. Uh, so, so it does require a complete test. There are a lot of ways to get it done, uh, but I like, I like the ball strikers personally. Yeah, absolutely. And Mark, Greg kind of stole a little bit of my thunder on this transition. Last five years, there's only been two different winners of this event. Sam Burns won it back-to-back. -back. We we missed it in 2020, canceled due to COVID. And then Paul Casey, back-to-back -back wins in the two years prior to that. So it's been uh, uh, not, not, a, not a very uh, well-shared trophy out there at Valspar. Yeah, there is a key to unlocking playing the place. I mean, before those two, Luke Donalds had tons of success around here. And you, you, Retif Hursen, for that matter, too. There's sort of a way to play this golf course. And I think a lot of what Greg highlights um, is the reason why. And I would first off say, like, if I had my yardage books here from all the Florida swing events, if you look at elevation change on holes, you'd see one or two yards. So it's negligible. Yeah, you can see up to 10 yards or so. And then you've got narrow, narrow fairways with just enough Bermuda rough. It's overseed now this time of the year um, where if you get in there to these tiny greens that typically play quite firm, hitting greens is very hard, which is why you see the uh, uptick of guys who strike the irons well. But I would build that back and say guys who play from the fairway are likely to have some success. Hence the Gooses and the Donalds and the Paul Casey's of the world. Um but think about that, too, because the golf course, from memory, it, it typically runs in the same direction, whereas last week you had holes pointing in every which way. So you're having a different wind direction on every hole. But here you basically get crosswinds on a bunch of the holes. And so that also, to me, always highlights a great ball striker, because in a crosswind, if you get something spinning against a draw wind, it's balls dying in the front bunker. If you get a ball drawing on a draw wind, you're missing long and left for a right hander. So. To the ability to stand balls up against the wind properly, um, to really control trajectory and crosswinds, I think that is sort of one of the one of the things around here. And so, if you're playing from the fairway, you'll have the advantage. But there certainly is there's a way to play this place. And all the winners, they sort of seem, in all my experiences when I've been there, to be playing from the same sort of place, you know. And and so that's why you see the the usual suspects kind of show up on the leaderboard. 
Love that. Okay, well, we'll talk about some of those usual suspects, and we'll do it in the form of our best bet. So here's what we do. We take $100 over to Caesars Sportsbook. We put 50 of it on a matchup of our choosing, 30 of it on a finishing position of our choosing, and then $10 each on two separate outrights. Please, Producer Josh, reveal the grid. Thank you very kindly. Okay, Greg, we will start here with you. Your matchup, please. My matchup is Davis Riley over Brian Harmon. Uh, and there are a couple of things. Davis Riley, of course, had a second place finish here last year, and he did miss the cut at the Players' Championship, but uh, tied eighth at the API, tied 29th at the Honda, and I'm sensing he's starting to find something with his ball striking, uh, starting to have a little bit of improvement in that area, and has spiked in the, well, he spiked in the putting at the API. Uh, and I, I think he has the ability, the capability to do that again. So I really like where Davis is Riley is headed. I, I really like his direction. And when it comes to Brian Harmon, I think he's kind of going the other way and he's, and he's favored. Uh, Brian Harmon has not really been hitting the ball very well at all. Um, I, I would say it's a pretty good course fit for him, but I, I think it's been a real struggle. I was, and I, when I was looking at this earlier, I can't, I can't seem to find Brian Harmon here. Um, but, but anyway, Brian Harmon has been losing strokes approaching the green. He's been losing strokes off the tee. Uh, his record has not been very strong. So I'm going Davis Riley over Brian Harmon. I have also opted to pick a bit on Brian Harmon. I've done it with Tommy Fleetwood uh, for a lot of the similar reasons. Harmon just hasn't been playing up to snuff here in 2023, just a little bit off and Tommy Fleetwood, very, very well rounded. Kyle opted for Justin Thomas over Jordan speed. That's why he got out of here. So he didn't have to say, <laughs> so he didn't, he didn't have to say that uh, himself. I'll say it for him. So Mark, you've opted for uh, not necessarily a star packed matchup, but these are the ones that generally are, are, are nice to cash on. Well, yeah, two things. First off, uh, Greg's bet jumped off the page at me when I saw it. I was leaning that way heavily. But mine's maybe a reaction to the stupid play I made last week for my top 40 bet. Because if you remember, I said, hey, um, Ben Arn is playing great. Um, I think he's a ball striker. You should pay attention. And his number last week was great. Well, the number this week is not as great. But he's playing against uh, a Johnny Vegas who I covered for a few uh, rounds there in the Honda. And by the incredible three iron um, that he hit on the last hole on Friday afternoon to make the cut, the rest of it was kind of scrappy. And there were lots of one-handed follow-throughs. He had his brother, his coach out there, and they were working hard. So I'm not so sure he's completely there because he didn't look that convincing at the players either. So uh, Ben Arn playing well, lives in Orlando, Florida, comfy in the conditions. I'm, I'm all over there. All right. um, by, by the way, Mark, yep. Zach was asking in the chat who my pale player of the week is. And <laughs> it, is it is Ben Arn. Ben on is my pale play of the week. So I love that play, Mark. Okay, please help me because I'm new on the show. What does pale play of the, of the week mean? Uh, th this is something that came up a few weeks ago where um, it, on rickrungood.com, he's got it color coded. So really strong strokes gain numbers are dark green. Really bad ones are dark red. And as they get closer to level, they kind of get a little pale. <laughs> and I've had a couple guys that Justin Rose, I think, was the first pale play of the week. Then he won, and that's, of course, why it's stuck. So Ben On has been a little pale, and, th and that's a good thing because things are turning in the right direction for him. Ben On flushes. Let me just tell you. It might not, he might not look good strokes gain-wise, but he can flush. No, yeah. it does look good. It looks good to me. Yeah, yeah, basically a golfer who's like just better than average all over the place, and then he pops right. off at the right time. And yeah, it's Greg's got a couple of them right recently, so it's <laughs> it's gaining it's gaining momentum. Um, Mark, I'll bounce this right back to you here. Our finishing position for this week, you can take anything you want: top five, top ten, top twenty. You have opted for a top forty, and I would like you to reveal to the people who it is. I uh, saw my rear end last week. I thought I was onto something with Adam Scott. Um, going with top forty again, Ben Griffin. Um, I've become a believer. You know, the story is awesome. A uh, guy who was a good player in college, got burned out on the game, wasn't making much money, went and worked in finance, then has a, someone sponsor him. Now he's uh, nearly a winner on the PGA Tour. So I made a point uh, prior to the players to go and watch him hit and play. And man, he spanks it. Okay, the thing gets hit. And he's playing with a whole lot of confidence. And so I talked to him some about the golf course. And he doesn't seem like he's out of his uh, comfort zone whatsoever. So I was like, I've got to try it. So Ben Griff, uh, Griffin, top 40. 
I love that. Kyle has opted for Gary Woodland, who's knocking the cover off the ball right now to finish inside the top 20, plus 190. I've gone with a little bit of a uh, international flair. Victor Perez, top 20 at plus 260 for this week. Very similar, or at least close enough, Greg, to Min Woo Lee. Guy playing great yeah. on the DP World Tour. Now coming over to the PGA Tour. We saw how that went for Min Woo. Maybe Victor Perez can follow it up. But you went with uh, the guy that is, uh, for more than one purpose, flowing in both his hair and his game. Yeah, he really is flowing. It's Tommy Fleetwood. Um, I don't tr- I don't trust enough th- for him to win. Uh, but if he took his name away, he would be a name I, I have circled for uh, for a win this week. Um, I just I'm not sure if Tommy Fleet was ready to win on the PGA Tour, but I'm certain that he'll finish inside that top 20. Uh, you look at what he's done lately. It's been eight straight events gaining strokes approaching the green and seven of them. It's more than a stroke and a half. So he is really he's hitting it really flush. Uh, his short game has been phenomenal. You have to go all the way back, at least on the PGA Tour, all the way back to the AT&T Byron Nelson of last year when he lost strokes around the green uh two out of the last three putting um it's been it's been really good all over the board for tommy fleetwood fleetwood top 20 victor perez top 20 gary woodland top 20 ben griffin top 40 how about some outrights uh a lot of crossover here kyle went with adam hadwin and justin rose he alluded to that Mark, you have a little bit of crossover there with Adam Hadwin. So let's talk through your two outrights, please. Well, Adam's playing nicely. He's happy around this place. And further to my conversation, my point I tried to make about horses for courses, this works for him. He's had success around here. T7, I think, last year. And you add that to the win from a few seasons ago. But I'm going there with Jordan Spieth. (laughs) You know, the ride is wild. He takes you through every myriad of emotion. Uh, we had him in feature groups coverage there on the marquee group last week. And he had some shots that made my eyes uh, roll over backwards uh, for good reasons and bad reasons. But I just think he looks comfortable enough right now where he can't contend. Uh, he, he seems to have kind of eliminated bar one, the wide ball. The miss is going in one direction where he used to have it going like right and left. Where now the miss I saw off the tee was largely left. This golf course, in a strange way, does like a draw. A few of the holes turn to the left, especially the tight ones. And so um, I I, I just like speed. He looks like he's percolating. And and, and so i got to go to a guy who won year earlier on in his career. Uh, Okay. Well, that makes, I think, both Greg and I feel pretty good because we both have Jordan Spieth on our card as well. I added Wyndham Clark to mine. Greg, what have you added to yours? I have added Justin Suh. Um, now Justin saw is a young player who can't, who turned professional with Morikawa and Hovland and Wolf. Uh, and he sat on the same stage with them and it took him a lot longer to get to the PGA tour. Uh, but now that he's here, he's made quite a splash in the Florida swing. Um, and coming out of Florida state, perhaps he's just comfortable in Florida. Um, or perhaps he's just that good and it's taken him a little while to find his game in the professional ranks. But this is a guy who was tied six last week at the players. I uh, was tied fifth at the Honda with the T24 at the API in between. And he has been, I mean, his statistics are anything but pale. These, these are dark green in the approach category. And, and it also the, the putting has been phenomenal. I mean, it, you're talking about four, he's gained four strokes putting in three out of the last five events. This is some really good stuff with a, a really high ceiling. And I feel like in a field like this, Justin Suh could be ready to uh, to really pop off and get his first win. I've got pick envy. I'm not so sure on the Fleetwood thing, but I have pick envy of yours there, Greg. And I'll tell you this. Have you watched Justin Suh play? That guy never, ever holds a golf club at full length. It's like he grew up playing with junior clubs his entire career, I'm guessing. And he just, when he got the big stuff, he's like, I can't be doing this. And he holds like way down the shaft, almost on the steel for many shots. But man, he, he he's a hitter. He can hit it. Oh, yeah. Jordan Spieth, Jordan Spieth, Jordan Spieth, Adam Hadwin, Adam Hadwin, Justin Rose, Justin Suh, Wyndham Clark are the eight outrights for the four of us for this week's 
Valspar Championship. We do get one extra bet. This is our, our best bet. It's an extra 50 bucks that we get to put on literally anything that we would like. I went with Ryan Gerard playing well. Monday queued in a couple of weeks ago. Played well at Honda. Played well in Puerto Rico to finish inside the top 40 plus 150. Kyle did tack on a little Justin Su Love top 20 at plus 180. Greg, we'll go to you. Uh, a guy we talked a lot about on Monday, I believe, with Sia, and, and you saw the same metrics that we were seeing. Who's your guy and what's your pick? Yeah, uh, Dylan Wu. Um, and Dylan Wu to me is, I actually like Brandon Wu as well, but Dylan Wu has been hitting the ball really well uh, with his with his irons especially, uh, which is clearly something that I really like. His finishes have been uh, somewhat middling, but but they've been really quite good. And I think for a top 40 for him at plus 150 is a really strong number for a guy playing as well as he is. Um, and I, so I think it's very doable. And I wouldn't be surprised if at the end of the week I felt like I left something on the table only going with a top 40. Dylan Wu plus 150 to finish inside the top 40. And Mark, we're in mid-season form. You have offered us a nationality selection. I'm 0 for 2. I'm hoping something hits. Um, there are four Swedes in the field. One, Ludwig Aberg is an amateur. He's legit. Uh, Vincent Norman, who can go, I feel like he might be handcuffed a bit around this place. Um, and then the other one is Henrik Norlander, who pops up, um, you know, when I least kind of want him to. So uh, David Lingmurth, who's playing very well, um, watched him now twice over the last two weeks. Solid, kind of got the game that fits this place, accurate place from the fairway. He's one of four, so at plus 180, I've got a 25% chance of winning. Uh, Lingmurth, top Swede. Justin Sud, top 20. Dylan Wu, top 40. Ryan Gerard, top 40 for the best bet wagers, which gentlemen leaves, with, leaves us with just one final thing to do. Our one and done selections, which have gotten much tighter since last week. But first, we're going to take a quick break and hear a word from our partners. What do you think we're going to uncover out there? With some luck, maybe a green jacket as sharp as the one you get when you win the Masters. It's a tradition unlike any other. The Masters on CBS. <laughs> okay. uh, one and done. Run me run me the, the board, please. Let's see how we did for this week. Oh, boy. All right. Now, Greg, you are in the unenv unenviable position of going first here because you are in last you have gotten leapfrogged by sia and kyle lamb thanks to scotty scheffler you're at 3.3 million who have you tasked with adding to that total for this week i have tasked tommy fleetwood who i did mention earlier as a, somebody who i really liked um in a top 20 scenario uh, i really like tommy fleetwood on this golf course and i think you're going to see him contend so um again take the name away take the past history away and i think you got somebody with a uh with a winning um you know a, a winning kind of game and i'm wondering maybe he can do it this week there are only two lone wolves this week and there are two separate three peats so a lot of overlap uh we'll see how that shakes out in the standings patrick though in seventh at 4.3 million is a lone wolf he has opted for keegan Bradley. Kyle Porter has opted for Adam Hadwin. He's at 5.3 million. Sia Najad, 5.8, has gone with Tommy Fleetwood. And Kyle M, who has asserted himself on the leaderboard, is now in fourth at 6.5 million and will lone wolf this with Wyndham Clark. Very solid strategy there and an opportunity to make up even more ground. The fans reeling after a John Rom mishap debacle <laughs> tummy tummy bug uh are going with Adam Hadwin 6.6 .6 million I've gone with Tommy Fleetwood at 7.9 mark 9.9 .9 million 2 million dollars clear you have Adam Hadwin you share him with the fans and with Kyle so uh it, it doesn't seem like there's going to be a ton of movement on the board this week of the picks I've had this season this one I'm sort of unsure about you know, everything at the outset says that Adam should play well. But, you know, when I've looked at him before and I've kept my eye on him, then he's played not so very well. Um, but I have to feel like after last week with a decent finish, I think it was inside the top 20, and you had to be good ball striking wise there last week. Um, maybe some of that carries over. Um, but as I look down the board here, it was, I, I'm surprised. I, I considered Justin Suffer a little while. I'm surprised we're not seeing a Justin Rose in there. 
Um, so I guess everyone's sort of trying to play defense and get a little money uh, before we head to match play and stuff like that. You know? How about this, Greg? I don't spy a Sam Burns on the board. The guy no. who's won this tournament two years in a row should have been a lock for somebody, right? Yeah, it's kind of surprising. And I'm kind of wishing I played him just for, uh, you know, as he would say, game theory kind of play. So, uh, well, we'll see how it plays out. But I think Mark's right. This looks very defense. This board looks very defensive. I have tr I tried uh, to get producer Josh to let me burn both Tommy Fleetwood and Sam Burns if he let me have Sam Burns right now. <laughs> like I'll just forego, I'll just give up Tommy for nothing to get access to to Sam Burns by myself. Here we go. We're gonna have another act. We're gonna have another uh, another asterisk. <laughs> he did not. He did not go for it. He upheld the uh, the integrity of way to be Josh the contest. So here we go from top down selections and earnings. Mark, 9.9 .9 million, Adam Hadwin. Rick, 7.9 million, Tommy Fleetwood. The Fan, 6.6 .6 million, Adam Hadwin. Kyle M, 6.5. Wyndham Clark, Sia, 5.8. Tommy Fleetwood. Kyle, 5.3. Adam Hadwin. Patrick, 4.3. Keegan Bradley. Greg, 3.3. Tommy Fleetwood. There you have it, gentlemen. Let's go. That'll do it. Any final thoughts? Uh, in regards to Valspar, bifurcation, or or there's a live golf event this week if you want to talk about that. Where are they playing? This week is Tucson, Arizona. Okay. Champions Tour was there a couple of weeks ago. They had snow, so I'm keen to see if uh, what happens this week. I got uh, some snow up here. It's snowing pretty good where I am. Oof. It's cold down where I am, so I'm sure yeah. it's cold where you are. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's not that good. The snow is not going to stick, but it's coming down pretty hard. I do want to say this. I, I, I've been on the road for a few weeks now, so I'm back home. So I watched some uh, high school ladies golf yesterday, and the azaleas are out en masse here in Georgia, which means tournament time. It won't be as colorful, but it will be green and good. So um, in a few weeks' time, the Masters, I don't think uh, we'll have as many azaleas around the place. They might be bloomed out couple notable round one pairings for the Valspar. Let's play this game. You can only choose one of them. Uh, Sam Burns, Jordan Spieth, Gary Woodland. JT Post and Justin Thomas, Joel Damon. Keegan Bradley, KH Lee, Webb Simpson. Justin Rose, Matt Fitzpatrick, Tommy Fleetwood. Greg, you get first pick. Uh, let's see. Um, what am I picking here? What my favorite Just, group is? Yeah, the, uh, if you had to only watch one, you, you're you only allowed to watch yeah, one of these groups and nothing easy, else. Easy choice. Uh, Sam Burns, Jordan Spieth, Gary Woodland. Yeah, that's the right one. Okay, Mark, you get second pick. That one's off the table for you. Yeah, thankfully, because my emotions were spent after having to call Jordan for a couple of rounds last week. Uh, I like that group of Englishmen, Rose and Fitzpatrick and Fleetwood. I'll, I'll, I'll go there. I'll easily sit and watch all of that. Okay, then I'll take Poston, JT, Joel Damon. I made out okay. I just they got to be mic'd up though, because I need I need the I need all the Damon commentary. I get to watch yeah. Justin Thomas play like that. I'll I'll take that group. That worked out okay for me. And JT Poston's fun too. Yeah, Justin Thomas was a little ragged last week. I was surprised. I thought he was going to really turn it around and and find a little form at a place that would kind of welcome what he does, but he just he, he just wasn't sharp, and you couldn't pointed to one area it was kind of odd uh, and he looked he looked but he looked unhappy with the way things were going so i'm keen to see how he bounces back this week all right well we will see how it all shakes out on thursday morning and we'll be back after each and every round to discuss whatever is going on in the world of golf but for now big thanks to producer josh does all the hard work behind the scenes mark immelman available on twitter at mark underscore immelman greg ducharme at the real gfd and you can find me at rick run good this has been the first cut we'll catch you next time